and we're going to get started. Um, we have uh, a lightning round called Partnering with Communities, and we've asked a number of folks we know are doing really exciting work in this area um, to, to um, explore the following questions. How have you and your institutions partnered with community members and organizations to build shared knowledge? And how have the tools of the humanities helped you address issues of diversity, inclusion, equity, and social justice together? Um, and so I'm, uh, I think you have the names, yeah. Um, we're, I'm gonna introduce our first presenter, Robin E. Bates, who's professor of English and John M. Turner, chair in the humanities. Uh, and program director for the Applied and Public Humanities minor at the University of Lynchburg, and also Lisa Crutchfield, who's assistant professor of history, also at the University of Lynchburg. And um, for those folks, oh, sorry, I'm looking the wrong way. Um, please come up to the podium to speak, and um, I will, uh, you know, I will interrupt you if you go too long. I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm Robin Bates, and um, so we have sort of different roles in the Applied and Public Humanities minor at the University of Lynchburg, and we're going to talk about the pieces of that that we, we bring to the table. Mine is, has been more of the curriculum development part of that. So um, we looked around and saw that we had professors a lot of it, Lisa, <laughs> working with community partners in the Lynchburg region and that the work they were doing with these community partners and with students was very ad hoc. It was a couple of students here working with, um, with the town of Bedford or working with Appomattox, um, working with the Sedalia, uh, Sedalia project, and it, we were trying to make it work with internships and trying to make it work with independent studies, and nothing was seeming to click, and it was part of reaching out individually to students who seemed interested. It was not consistent, and it was not seeming to um, be open or legible to a wide range of students, and we decided that by creating a minor program that had coursework that could build from an introductory course that provided basic skills and ended in a capstone course through which they could do a project um, that also helped them have those skills going into the course. They weren't having to be trained while they were doing the project. Would make it open, would make it available, would make it something that students could find in the catalog any student can find it. They don't have to have had a course with you and have heard about it um, and already have a relationship with a professor. So it's more open, it's more inclusive that way. So um, I was more um, involved in the curriculum development. I am the program director. Um, but the community partnership work, that is Lisa. And so I'm going to hand that over to her now. Thanks. So we had, um, as Robin said, we had a uh, been doing a lot of community outreach and community partnerships um, with various institutions, various uh, historic houses, museums, those sorts of things. And Robin really was able to pull together the curriculum that kind of gave that all structure. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, but the community projects that we are working on and we, we're, we're trying to continue to expand um, opportunities for our students and our partnerships into the communities and in the last year we have added three new community partners so I just kind of wanted to briefly go over those to, to explain what, what it is that our students are doing. Um, so we had uh, one, um, one of our new community partners was the Bedford Historical Society, um, one was a historic house uh, and one was a Sedalia Cultural Arts Center. Um, the, sorry, the, um, <laughs> our first, uh, our, our, our Bedford Historical Society and Sedalia are kind of connected through education in terms of the idea that they um, both physically occupy um, schools that were built in the 1950s as black educational facilities uh, as a way as Virginia was trying to stave off um, integration. And so Bedford Historical Society is working very closely with enthusiastic alumni of Susie G. Gibson High School um, to 
reconnect, to get that history back um, and to reclaim what, what, what happened at that, uh, that high school. Um, the Sedalia Art Center is a community art center that physically occupies a, a, a elementary school um, called Counter Ridge that was built in 1959 for again the same purpose. So it was the, the black school in the county and um, this art center is there now and they recognize the importance of that facility to the community and want to connect and reach out with them. So our students have been going through microfilm newspapers, um, connecting information to anything about either of those schools, uh, looking at um, principal names, teachers' names, honor rolls, and you know, just collecting whatever bits of information they can to help reclaim that history and connect that community um, and those, those centers with the community that they, that they are part of. Uh, we have a historic house as well that is connected to the college, and that one's a little bit different. Um, it's your typical, you know, 1790s uh, plantation house um, that was, uh, well, that, well, um, we have uh, all sorts of records and interesting tidbits from it, but in terms of the connection with the community, we're looking at traditional and non-traditional ways. So. Um, our students were looking at uh, trying to figure out what the enslaved population looked like um, at that plantation through the traditional records, you know, 1850s and 1860s census, slave census records uh, to, to be able to, to kind of at least put um, an, an idea of what the slave population was. But we're also looking at more uh, or less traditional ways in terms of as we move into the modern era, that um, house what the, the, ho the homeowner was able to keep um, the Appalachian Power Company from encroaching on the land. Uh, they wanted to put up power lines um, and ruin his pristine view, and he fought that off. Uh, but the approach, the approach that we take is looking at, well, okay, this is a social justice issue. You succeeded because you were a wealthy landowner, and they didn't go in there. Where did these power lines go? How were those decisions made? And what does that mean for our community? Right, so those are just three examples. Um, and I know I'm out of time, so thank y'all very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am a proud recipient of one of the course transformation grants uh, for my course, Sounds Like Social Justice, which is a course focused on sound studies. And um, I was really enthusiastic about this grant because it allowed me to purchase uh, recording equipment for my, not only for my class, but this equipment is now uh, a part of the library of equipment that the whole English department can use. So I wanted it to go beyond just, you know, what my students could do, but be also tools available for the wider faculty to have at their disposal to do projects where they would need technology. Uh, for an extended amount of time and you know if you were doing interviews in the field or something like that uh, this past fall uh, my students and i were able to work with um, uh, the folks over at still meadow community fellowship church which is really close to umbc it's right down the frederick road and uh, some of you may remember all of the flooding in ellicott city uh, that really made national news um, uh, more than once, actually. Um, uh, but most people don't know that all that water flowed downhill into the Irvington and Beachville community, which is literally, uh, you know, not too much more than a mile from campus. Uh, so this, uh, my students and I wanted to work on this particular issue and tell a story about the, um, the ways that the community was underserved, but also just uh, as a way of thinking about the role of sound in, in storytelling, right? Uh, so um, if you can hit the next slide for me. Um, uh, one of our community partners was Pastor Michael Martin, um, and he was a really, really terrific partner, excellent storyteller. Uh, we took all the students uh, down to the church, and he gave them a, a tour of not only um, the area around the church where there was a lot of flooding, but also, more importantly, uh, the Still Meadow uh, Peace Park. Uh, so uh, most folks don't know there's a huge 10-acre lot of woods just over a, you know, a mile away on the, the church's property that they've turned into this really, really uh, um, surprising and creative community 
uh, project uh, that's attracting grants all from all kinds of places. Uh, so that was a pleasant discovery for my students as well. But uh, we also got to work with, uh, can you hit the next slide for me? Um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Rona Cobell, who's a an environmental journalist in Baltimore. And through the support of the grant, I was able to give her some funding and support to come and work with the students in class when it came to how to go out and do interviews in the community. And then also she just brought you know, all the experience she had working on uh, environmental justice issues to the course as well. So uh, with, with the help of the community partners, um, the students came together and we worked on a podcast. That was our, our project for the semester. Um, do, I, and ha do I have any time left? Minutes, okay. Yeah. You, hopefully, you guys want to listen to, to some of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It should be able to play on the next thing, and maybe we can hear like one or two minutes. A tale of two floods and two cities one that got the help it needed, and one that had to fend for itself. This is Underserved Underwater, episode one. The power of that rushing water washing cars away as they were toys. The water just keeps coming in, quite frankly, there's nowhere for it to go. Flood waters ran cars into buildings and tore up pavement. The water burst through the door, tossing eight foot long display cases like dollhouse furniture. Not even two years later, a vibrant city once again ran into turmoil. Every time it rains here, the community heart stops. After all that resilience has time again, it's terrible. And climate change continues to warm the planet, we could see even more storms of this stricken. <coughs> On July 30th, 2016, the area surrounding historic Ellicott City was hit with a devastating flash flood. To make matters worse, another severe flood struck the city just two years later, on May 27th, 2018. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan declared a state of emergency that Sunday afternoon as water levels rose to 17.8 feet. The flooding took out several homes and local businesses in the Ellicott City area. According to official reports, 96% of the businesses on the Main Street area were affected. The cause of the flooding was the almost nine inches of rain that poured down all at once, amounting to about two months worth of rain buildup. Given that the area is very urban, the surrounding land was not able to handle the immense torrent of precipitation. Governor Hogan reported that it was like a once every 1,000 year flood, and yet it happened twice in two years. He continued to report on the aftermath of the flood, saying how it was so devastating because of how people have centered their lives around this area, and they had to go through a similar disruptive experience twice in such a small amount of time. Moreover, thanks to a state of emergency declaration, Ellicott City received much attention and support from the state of Maryland in its rebuilding efforts. But with all the commotion around Ellicott City, local neighborhoods that were also affected by the flood were neglected including a Baltimore City neighborhood just a few miles away, Irvington. According to the topographical map of Baltimore City and adjacent parts of Maryland, Irvington is at a lower elevation, around 250 to 300 feet, compared to nearby areas. Certain parts of Baltimore City and Ellicott City, which is prone to flooding, are at higher elevations than Irvington, around 300 to 450 feet. As a result, with heavy downpour, the rainwater could run off to nearby areas of lower elevation, including onto Irvington. Irvington is a large, close-knit community located in southwest Baltimore City. It's very close to the UBC area, and it's just a few miles down the street from Ellicott City. The neighborhood consists of a mixture of single-family homes and apartments. So we got some great interviews, and the students were just really yeah. happy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, so as an example, I, I think I want to get into a little more detail. Well, I shouldn't say a little more detail. Some detail um, about a wonderful partnership, uh, humanities, um, humanities partnership that we had with UMBC faculty. And um, I should go back just a little bit to explain how we got into that uh, collaboration in summer 2021 with UMBC. Um, before that, in 2018, um, my institution um, completed a multi-million dollar renovation of a historic um, mansion on our Catonsville campus. Um, and, and coincidentally, in our table talks, uh, one of the UMBC faculty members is familiar with the campus, familiar with the um, building, but had no idea that it had um, antebellum um, origins, but um, it had been an area landmark for um, nearly two centuries, and it's been on the National Register of Historic Places uh, since 1980. Um, 
Nevertheless, the building was uh, always underutilized on our campus, and, and certainly its history um, under-acknowledged, both on the campus and in, and in the um, local um, community. But with the renovation, uh, there was more attention, more curiosity, more student engagement with that um, particular space. Uh, with the renovation, our Global Studies program and the Honors program, uh, which I direct, was centered um, in that space. And so we certainly saw it as an opportunity to uh, quote unquote educate uh, students about the history of that building and the history of the community. And initially we did this uh, series of lectures and exhibits and campus tours uh, where we thought to share a little something about um, uh, the history of the campus. Um, but what we learned, just to um, cut to the, sh the chase, was that it was very necessary to center our students in the research process, to make that, ex that experience um, more engaging, um, more immersive, rather than have students as passive listeners um, to historians who we'd invited to campus. Um, and this, for me, came about uh, when a student asserted that she would never walk into that building. Um, and, and I was taken aback a bit. Um, I, I should acknowledge I'm a, I'm a native of Louisiana. Um, I'm of a different age than my students. And I, I, I certainly won't say that I had a, um, a, a a uh, blasé or dismissive regard for um, African American history, uh, but certainly my attitude um, about that history was different in the sense that I I, um, I, I didn't regard it in the same way. I didn't. Um, I wouldn't have had that kind of reaction. Growing up in Louisiana, there would have been a whole lot of spaces that I couldn't enter um, if I were, you know, to to sort of um, em embrace that attitude. And, and so I had to acknowledge that the student experiences was different. She rightfully saw it as a site of um, horror and, and, and trauma. And um, given that many of our students are locals, you know, they, she may well have been a member of this, the descendant community. And so it was very necessary for us to reframe our education around the Hilton Mansion so that um, our students could, of, of course, begin to d direct the, um, the orientation and the study and have a voice, a sense of belonging, a say, and that their families, their communities, their churches could be centered in the way in which we sought to narrate any kind of history um, uh, about this space and place. Um, and with that, we were able to, um, to engage with um, UMBC and their public history program, uh, Denise Maringolo in particular, and, and she brought in a number of people um, from UMBC to assist us. And, and with that, um, beyond the academics, we were able to, to um, engage with community activists, um, uh, griots in the local community. Um, uh, um, and unfortunately, uh, the, the local repository of African American history um, uh, has recently passed away, Mr. Lewis Diggs, just a few months ago, and I regret that we weren't able to get in the space that we hope to uh, in terms of engaging the community. But we, we've had a, a wonderful foundation thanks to the connections we've established um, through that project. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Mary Foles, and I am the co-director of the Southside Initiative. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the Southside Initiative. We are funded through the provost office at Lehigh University with a small, small budget. But we are funded through the provost, and our primary purpose is to create sustained community university partnerships that, um, that uh, improve the quality of life in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. We're right by Bethlehem Allentown, about an hour out of New York City, an hour out of Philly, if you make a triangle there. Um, and we do those partnerships primarily around research, and we're very interested in equity, um, diversity, and inclusion in most of our collaborative projects. Sometimes we work on it, um, environmental projects, we do some public health projects as well, but all, in all of our projects, we're very much interested in um, equity and social justice. So I want to start by saying a few of the kinds of projects that we've developed over um, 
uh, the, really the past decade. Uh, we've worked on public history projects, so we partnered with our Bethlehem NAACP and their Esther M. Lee um, archives. Um, so we house the archives, they're on loan at Lehigh University while that project seeks to find a building where they could have the NAACP archives. We've partnered on the Voces a la Comunidad oral history project, which is an oral history project that um, is collecting the stories of Latinx members of our community in Bethlehem. We've partnered on uh, literary arts, public facing literary arts programs, such as our Finding HD series. Uh, the poet HD, really famous modernist poet, is from Bethlehem. Uh, and so we did a, a series that was over a year in which we asked, uh, what would it be like to center a queer, um, you know, feminist poet as a part of our central civic identity rather than, let's say, Bethlehem Steel, which is, you know, <laughs> right in the middle of, of our city? What would that look like? Um, and we spent a year exploring that through a series of literary arts programs. Um, oh, one of our community members wrote a play, so there was a play that was a part of that. It was a series of events throughout the year. Uh, but today I want to focus on a partnership that we have with our local um, LGBT community center. It's called Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center, and that's in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, for, oh gosh, really since 2016, I've been working with them on a variety of public uh, humanities or public scholarship projects, if you wouldn't mind flipping the side, slide. Uh, this partnership started uh, simply by um, when I became director of the Southside Initiative, I was asking some uh, organizations that I already was familiar with, what do you need? What do you need? And Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center said that they really needed to update their library. It was sort of like um, your lesbian aunt's library from the 1970s. Um, it's good, but you like you maybe want some more like you know contemporary stuff. So uh, we wrote a small grant. Uh, we were able to update their library. They're particularly interested in trans health. Um, they were particularly interested in more recent LGBTQ plus fiction. Uh, so we spent we, the grant allowed maybe. Uh, $1,500 to buy new books for their collection. They wanted a card catalog online where people could find out what was in their collection. And then as a part of that, they wanted marketing materials, so we did that too. And then I started a community reading group with my colleague, Chelsea Gilbert. Um, and that was just a series of two, but they were so popular that we started an annual series where we read LGBTQ plus um, memoirs is what we started on. Um, from there, part of what Southside Initiative wants to do is sustained partnerships. So we start with, what do you need? Let's see if we can write a grant to supply that. And then let's keep going. What else might we do together? How else might I be of service? How else might we be of service? And so from after this um, uh, literary arts group, we developed an oral history project. Um, which we interviewed elders, activists, and leaders in our community who are really making a difference. Um, one of the questions that we were asked in preparing is why, why does public humanities or public, public scholarship matter? Um, and for our community, we're a, we're a smaller uh, area. It can feel like LGBTQ plus history. It happens in New York. It happens in San Francisco. But in our little neck of the woods, it can feel like that history doesn't happen uh, in Allentown. Uh, we have a vibrant, robust, politically active, um, incredibly fun LGBTQ plus community in Allentown. We're small, but we're fierce. Um, and so recording some of the histories of our leaders, how they've been involved in civil rights struggles, struggles for our trans and non-binary liberation, uh, queer liberation broadly, struggles for equity matter because we are, in our small neck of the woods, a part of larger movements for liberation, equity, and justice. Uh, so the stories of these liter leaders um, which is uh, Trish, Ricardo, and Chloe are captured um, via oral histories. Of course, with their consent and permission, they're placed online so that our community can access some of the stories of those that are uh, really making a difference in our community. Uh, next slide. From there, we decided to work on some public scholarship together. So I collaboratively write with our community partners. It benefits them in terms of their grant writing. So that's a piece I wrote with uh, four authors, an archivist, uh, two people that work at the community center. Um, and this was published in Inter Alia. It's based on an oral history project that was looking at um, how those that had survived the early years of HIV were reflecting on the COVID-19 uh, epidemic in that first year. And so it was really kind of a public health oral history project, like what are you remembering now? And we did that because a lot of our elders during the early months of COVID were like, um, you know, having memories of people they had lost, 
So their grief was coming back up from those early years of, of uh, the HIV epidemic. They were listening to politics and political rhetoric about public health, and they were feeling these sort of echoes uh, from the uh, uh, Reagan and, and Bush years. And so it felt really important for us to collect those stories and those memories. Um, so collaborative really writing is something else we've done. Next slide, and then I'll finish, because I see I'd like I'm getting pulled up. Um, we did another one. Next slide. We did another um, piece where this was more letters. Um, I think I'll, the thing I'll conclude on is, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, is we've started a quick queer history um, project, which is short excerpts from our archives. And, and the corner there, I won't play it because we don't have time, but that's me. They're 90 second videos where we talk about regional history. I wanted to call them queer quickies, but I was told um, <laughs> that was not going to work. Uh, so it's quick queer history. Um, <laughs> That is about regional history. Um, and then finally, we're using our archives to do a found poetry event, which is getting more community members into the archives to reflect about our regional history. I'm so excited to have been here today. Thank you all for letting me speak. No, I'll get off. Thank you, Jessica. And it's hard to follow up queer quickies. I <laughs> Set up. Um, so my name is Sarah Fouts, and uh, I'm going to present on uh, the Baltimore Field School, um, which is our, our current iteration with Baltimore Field School 2.0. Um, and it really launched in 2020 and then 2021 um, with Mellon funded uh, project. Um, and just to kind of give overview um, is kind of thinking about a field school going into the field, training uh, faculty, graduate students, uh, staff to do work with people. We're kind of building it e even bigger to really think about these ethical questions um, being collaborative in these projects, bringing in community partners, really engaging them, centering their projects in, in these processes. Um, the research question that we're looking at is how to move away from extractive uh, field work, um, that, 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 or extractive research. Um, so what, what that means, and I'll give an example, working with a community partner in East Baltimore who works with Latinx communities. When I moved here four and a half years ago, he was talking about how uh, you know, universities, I won't name names here, but would, would use extractive practices and come in and use the community as a laboratory, and use that word laboratory, and they would do a survey or practice their different methods with the Latinx community in these different ways, but they would never see the product, or they would never be told what it was, or it was just kind of a practice. And so he was like, I don't want to do that, like I want to move away from that. So it's like, how do we build stuff that's collaborative, that's useful, that's relevant, is the big word that we came up with our, at our table when we are talking about the questions earlier. And so that's part of what we're, you know, the, the design and the ideas that are coming out of this. And so what it looks like, well, what it started with, with the, the first year with the Mellon Grant was um, 14 um, UMBC faculty of Charlotte, uh, Mike Cassiano, who's here, me, and led by uh, Nicole King, um, who, and Dean Moffat was the PI on the project that year, um, who we came together, we had two community partners, Curtis Eady II and uh, Eric Jackson, who were really the consultants and helped design the, the different projects. And we brought p folks in like Patrick um, and uh, uh, D Denise Maringolo, Mary Rizzo, a lot of folks to kind of talk about these successful projects that work to build sustainable, um, like Mary said, these sustainable uh, projects in the community. So that's kind of the idea. And then moving into this second iteration of it, the 2.0, if you go to baltimorefieldschool.org, you can see um, I don't have slides like everyone else, uh, I apologize. Um, but you, but so the second iteration is to really build on that model, but bring in more community partners. So this year we're really excited to have eight community partners um, and almost match the, the number of UMBC uh, faculty staff. We brought in staff, not just faculty and undergraduates. So we kind of expanded that part as well. Um, and we introduced, so we launched our community partners in the fall and they are uh, kind of do a quick rundown, they, anything from food justice to housing, um, justice to kind of public information. So we have folks, uh, again, like Eric Jackson, who's doing uh, Black Yield Institute, um, Tisha Guthrie, who's with uh, Organized Poppleton doing housing justice, um, uh, Aisha Alfahada, who does uh, food justice um, with Mirror Kitchen Collective. Um, there's a, a Betty uh, uh, Bland Thomas, who does um, housing neighborhood kind of public history work. And so we, when we can, we match them with UMBC um, folks to be able to pair to develop teaching and research around these projects. So it's really kind of this collaborative. And we're about to launch or, or announce our uh, UMBC fellows that will this summer will have a, a workshop, um, week-long workshop in uh, in our campus, uh, our classroom that's in the city, 
Um, and so we'll bring in our community partners, we'll bring in the UMBC faculty staff and, and, and graduate students to talk about these issues of, of collaboration and building projects, um, et cetera, in this ethical way that's just, you know, taking cues from communities and building these projects together that's more sustainable. Um, big things to announce, and I'll be really quick, I don't know, I, I forgot to start my timer, so I don't know what's happening here. Um, okay, so two big things I think are important to talk about here is like kind of navigating uh, the bureaucracy and one of the two successes that we'll have, which I'll focus on, um, is we were able to get the, the community partners that wanted to have them to get them UMBC cards, okay, so they can access the shuttle, they have office space, um, they can use library resources, any sort of resources that I can access, they can access with their cards. So that's been a huge success um, and we're really excited to have that. Um, a second thing I'll talk about, and this was really with help with, with Jessica Berman um, and Rachel Brubaker and, and Tamara Bala. Um, we worked, to, and, and, and it's happened before with Nicole King, who, who's who been kind of, you know, kind of the backbone of all of this, um, really to get this extractive language taken out of contracts. Um, when we're working with folks, and we're get paying people to do this collaborative research, and then we say, it's all this is UMBC's intellectual property, mm -hmm. and trying to get that language out, so we've really, been uh, successful in doing that. If you want, would like for me to share that with anyone, I'm more than happy to do so. Um, and with our advisory committee, with our public communities minor, we're sharing that information. We're trying to work with Permenda to, to make that more accessible as well. Um, let's see. I think that's, um, let me. I think that, oh, yeah, and we, well, I'll, I'll end on this. We're, we, you know, we're building, using, we have a, Nicole and I and Tahir Mahdi, who's our great evaluator, she did an excellent report um, from the 1.0 and is working with us for the 2.0, so we really have this really strong evaluation component. And we have a, a, a publication that's um, in the read, advise, resubmit that talks about this process, so you can kind of, this will be publicly accessible through an open source journal. Um, soon. Probably not that soon, but you know how that goes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Um, thanks. Uh, I apologize in advance. It's not like I'm trying to make a political statement by rushing over here. I simply forgot my mask, so I apologize. Um, if I step out after the presentation, it's only because I went to get my mask and I want to abide by the rules of the village. <laughs> um, so suffice it to say that uh, folks at UMBC have been keeping me quite busy as a <laughs> high school teacher, entertainingly so. Like I feel this uh, is very enriching. I'm really uh, encouraged by the um, relationships that I've been able to develop with Nicole King and Sarah Fouts here. So thank you all very much. This is all very exciting for me because I have a PhD, but I teach at Bard High School Early College, which is an interesting um, institution, but that allows me to do public humanities projects that I like to do and engage my students, which is probably what I'd be doing traditionally at a, as a professor in a liberal arts college anyway. So thank you all for that. Okay? And the project that I want to talk to you about is a student project that I did with uh, Chicory Magazine. Um, Chicory Magazine uh, is a black arts era uh, grassroots uh, authentic uh, poetry magazine that was produced um, by the Enoch Pratt Library. Um, its longtime editor, uh, Melvin Brown, uh, did a, an excellent job of curating monthly issues of um, unheard, heard and unheard voices from the Baltimore community and put them in a magazine um, to distribute widely for free um, with the Enoch Pratt Library as a hub. Um, so through UMBC, um, we participated in a chicory revitalization project um, to kind of revive the magazine, revive uh, interest in, this, in its archive as a repository of authentic and grassroots um, black culture and history. And what I'm trying to do is spin curriculum out of that. So I'm faculty in literature uh, at Bar High School Early College. Um, I teach ninth grade uh, literature of the Americas, and I teach our college course, which uh, is a first year seminar. It's basically like a, um, uh, it's posited as a great books course, but I posit it as a great books course and its uh, cr critiques. No. <laughs> no. Um, and what I'm gonna present to you is a project that I did with my students when we did a, um, uh, a workshop with Melvin Brown at the Chicory Archives, um, and then had uh, my students produce work to produce a zine to go along with an exhibit um, that was done in coordination with Mary Rizzo, who's a professor of American Studies, 
I think, uh, at, uh, at Rutgers University. So that was part of the exhibit that has been traveling around to different parts, different branches of the Enoch Pratt Library. I don't know if you can see it from here, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I want to read from you, let's see, a couple of the poems that my students created. So the idea was that we visit the archives, we see what Chiggery is all about, we hear some of the voices. Uh, they had studied it for a couple weeks. It's like a unit in my uh, ninth grade class and my year one seminar. Um, and they studied the archives. They picked um, poems that they liked. They got to talk to Melvin Brown about, uh, like about this, the, the poems and the art that they liked. And then we had a workshop where a very experienced poetry critic got to work with students to produce some pretty cool stuff. Okay. Uh, which one am I going to read? I do this because I really love, as a teacher of literature, um, well, yeah, teacher of literature, but really like uh, a nerd about language, particularly the juxtaposition between like African American vernacular language and standard written English. I like to teach my students that both are valuable. Okay? Um, I'm going to read, okay. This is a uh, student who I had, had in ninth grade, uh, Maya Massey. Um, it's called You Got This. It's very inspirational. I can't imitate her voice, but I say it every day, all day, at any time, at any moment, you got this. No matter how many people hurt you, you got this. No matter how much you've been through, you got this. No matter how much of a struggle your childhood was, you got this. No matter how many people left, you got this. Don't ever forget and bet not ever slip from those fingertips. Every time you think you don't got it, girl, you better get it because you always will have it. Remember, you got this, okay? This is from her, like you can imagine uh, anyone picking this up and seeing that this is kind of like a reflexive, kind of like self-help guy, right? This is what Amaya says she says to herself in the mirror every day before she comes to school. I think that's cool. I'm glad you think so too. Um, the next one I want to read, let's see. Ah, okay. This is called Black Man's Ballad, and it was written by Salah Abdurrahman. Um, he is at Howard University, and I'm sure this is why I wrote him a letter of recommendation to go to Howard University, because I'm sure he is he's doing there he's doing well there swimmingly. Okay. Um, I believe Salah was our valedictorian or salutatorian. Listen to this. This is just an excerpt. Black Man's Ballad. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light? What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through perilous fight over the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave, oh, say, can you see by the rioters' blight? We so proudly display and are surprisingly outright, and the people go forth to the perilous north with outrage from the south, slurs from every mouth. Oh, say, do you not know what the flag, uh, what flag scars you over the land of false decree and the home of the slave? Ode to America's red, white, and blue, the stars, the stripes, the cross that bears you. Ode to the eagle, pristine in its shine, in God we trust, but in darkness we rive. Ode to the ex of America's great past, not the man, but the symbol of slavery's, of slavery's caste. Uh, and ode to the system of 400 years past, for now we rebel, and this time your, is your last. Now do we, uh, sorry, now do as we have done and sing, sing with a thunderous voice begging to the heavens for salvation. Sing for a reckoning of, for the souls of injustice, past and present. Lift every voice and sing and come together in unity and prosperity. Good Lord. Like reading it again is kind of like that. So it's cool, thanks. <laughs> Makes me always if you feel good. Make some noise if you don't feel good. Okay, so uh, it, uh, now, 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 it's time for the poet, 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 who will not be doing a poem. Um, okay, let me figure out, how could I describe, I really like these pens. Um, how could I break down in just five minutes uh, the lightning in a bottle that is, see what I did there, the lightning in a bottle that is Do More Baltimore. Um, let's see. 
Do More Baltimore is a literary-based organization that uses performance poetry to help youth to actualize their voice by creating platforms that they can use as a catalyst so that they can shape and form the world that they want to see in their community and ellipses, 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 ellipses. That, that's like the mission statement slash like elevator speech version of it, right? But it's much more deeper than that. Um, it's in, in actual real life and like the daily programmatic practice of Duma Baltimore. It's like a whole different thing. Um, it, it's literally the personal that shapes everything around you. Like there's the cliche that like real change starts here, starts with yourself. Like, but like it's really real because we're really like activating them to be that for themselves and for their community. And so poetry is this really personal thing where it's like it's, it's almost impossible to engage in poetry without actually engaging with yourself and the world around you. And so like that doesn't necessarily work unless you're tapping into the personal part and you're destroying this invisible wall between like, okay, this is the poetry and this is the person. Like it's all the same thing. And so and then that leads into like this magical portal of like, oh, I can activate my voice with the things that I want to be actually talking about. And then that stretches out beyond just the page and the poem and the stage and the performance. It's kind of like a, a, a quadruple A kind of thing. It's like like a ah, which, which is like like helping them be advocates, activating action through art, um, and like that's essentially what happens. And what we see is that they're able to actually take charge of the leadership aspect in the organization and it becomes youth driven and youth led by them. Like for example, during the pandemic when they were just like we don't know what the point of poetry is right now. We're not <laughs> sure what life is right now. And so they came up with the idea to create a new initiative in the organization called Poetry is Mental Health, that they started doing Zoom meetings and then they started doing workshops when things were slowly coming back and will hopefully be like a regular initiative as a part of our in-school programs. Um, or, or when the uprisings were happening and a few days after George Floyd and they were like, we don't know what to do, but we have to do something. And it was like, well, we don't quite know what to do. We're not necessarily like an organization that does like mass protests, but if that's what you feel like needs to happen, let's collaborate with these organizations who do that. And through like a face, a quick Facebook, a Facebook message, all of a sudden they had a whole bunch of advocates from organizations who do that kind of work, like leaders of a beautiful struggle in the block, and and um, and all of a sudden they were like, wow, we're organizing something and in like four days. Five youth were like, we're going to put something together, and hopefully like two hundred people will show up, and then. 2,000 plus people showed up and they marched through the city like in the middle of the pandemic because they were like, we can't just sit in the house and do nothing. So like that's kind of what happens when like the political and the personal um, prove that they're the same thing. And when the poetic and the personal prove that the same thing, like that's what happens with using performance poetry and writing as a catalyst for youth development. And you know, around the country, we're pretty well known for like, we win a lot of poetry slam. Like we do, we win, do well in the competitive side of things, but it's like, that's really just practice so that the work and the poems can be on stages and in places where like, they're really needed in front of audiences the most and they're like at their best, most polished version of them. And so, so we, we collaborate with literary, literary initiatives like Chicory, um, like the National Youth Poet Laureate Competition. Um, we had a Youth Poet Laureate of Baltimore who made it all the way to the top four finalists of the national competition um, a few years ago. Um, and we have a, a summer writing initiative, the Maya Baraka Writers Institute, that um, we're actually looking to potentially get funded to be a year-long program. Um, and so it really does start with them with themselves and then it's, it's a ripple effect from there. And it's like, it's this thing where art and activism can be artivism. Um, the art is able to be the activism. Um, and so for me, it, it, the personal part is actually like extremely profound. Um, when we started Do More Baltimore in 2012, I didn't have any children. Now today in 2023, I have five children that are all adopted and have all come through a do more program of some kind at some point. In fact, when I leave here, I have to leave shortly after lunch because I'm gonna meet with one of my daughters and we're gonna, we're gonna start plotting about what is the next phase? What can be more for do more? Like we want to create some sort of version of a living 
a living system where we can find real estate where youth who are transitioning out of youth programming and are like beginning the stages of, of adulting who are who are often displaced because they either just don't have a traditional strong family structure or or a lot of times we have a lot of queer youth in our program and if they come out to their family and then all of a sudden they don't have a family anymore it's like how can there be a house where like literally young adults can like live for like low rent and and this can be like a bridge between between when like all of a sudden youth services are gone and it's like okay now you're on your own you're an adult and you just you just out here and so like that's kind of like the next big thing but yeah, uh, that's five minutes and like 27 <laughs> seconds. Um, I was going to try to sneak a little poem in there, but no, you can see lots of that if you go on YouTube and just look up, do more poetry. There's like thousands of videos. Thousands of poems. Thanks to you all, and obviously we could have had any one of these people speak for the full you know, 45 minutes. Um, I do want to take some time to take some questions from the audience. I think it's important. Um, and there are a lot of amazing uh, programs being represented up here. Uh, there should be a mic. Uh, Younger has a mic. So uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question or, or make a point um, about any of these programs you've heard about. Oh, come on, y'all. <laughs> yep, right here. And, and just say your name before you speak, and you know if you want to say a quick identifier. Thank you. Thanks. Michael Hunt, um, director of the UMBC McNeil College Program. I'm curious, and this is really open up to all, because especially seeing this as the section talking about connecting with communities. Um, what was the challenge? Because um, um, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, but um, I think sometimes institu as an institution, um, we have ways of being where communities have their own also ways of being. And so I'm curious as to those who had to enter into communities from the institutional side, in essence, what were some of those challenges that you found and how did you sort of deal with those challenges and really have um, the community embrace what you were trying to do um, um, without it feeling though it was favorism or the sense of you trying to uh, take over, do it, you know, all that. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's really just open up to all because this is an area of interest of mine. Thanks. Takers, would you come up to the podium, please? I feel like you threw me a softball because this is what I wanted to say and didn't have time to, so thanks. <laughs> um, for, for us in particular, I don't, I don't even know that it's so much of a challenge, but we had our three community partners that we added this year all came to us and sought, sought things out. So I just wanted to make a point that there are, you know, institutions and communities and historic houses and whatever that are having the same struggles in terms of wanting to reach out to the community that they are a part of um, and have limited resources and we can serve as functioning segues for them there. Um, the one of the ones that I mentioned that is uh, presently is a community <clears throat> arts center um, that occupies Counter Ridge School had um, said that they had sent out a request to every institution within an hour and a half radius and we were the only ones who responded. So just as sort of a informational piece in terms of making those connections, I thought that was important to say. For me, this is just such a crucial question. Um, before I, I guess I got out to Lehigh around uh, 2009, and before I got there, there had been really tense relationships between the institution, which is a private um, uh, private university in um, in that portion of Pennsylvania, and our surrounding community. Um, like you know, things like the university um, purchased land and displaced a whole neighborhood so they could build. Uh, new structures. Um, so I, my answer to this question is I think in many ways I, I see myself as trying to um, redress uh, some of the past uh, behavior and movement of the institution. And one way that the Southside Initiative does that is we don't show up with our own needs and desires, which I think was inherent <coughs> in your question, in, you kind of allude to that in your question. Instead, um, 
It's not, I, I have a class and I'm hoping you can help me with my class. We don't say that. Um, I have this research project. I'm hoping you can help me. It's, we don't say that. It's like I show up and let's have coffee. What are you doing? You know, what grants are you working on? What are your projects? Um, is there any way we could help? That's like our starting conversation. Um, my goal is sustained long-term partnerships and that takes trust over time. Um, and I, I wanna start that conversation, like what are the needs and, and then be honest about, is there anything that uh, we might be able to supply? And from those conversations, we can end up like our um, Voces de la Comunidad, uh, that oral history project. What was really needed was not university leadership, it was like cameras, um, task cam audio equipment, and then because it was a community-led project, oral history training with a community focus. And that's what we did with our grant. So all of the equipment, we loaned to community members who became community-based oral history historians. Um, that was Janine Carumbo Santoro um, uh, and, and, and others. She's a librarian that started that project. So we were really in a kind of service role um, so I could give resources and then step back. Um, and with other projects, space is what was needed for especially community-based archives that don't yet have their own buildings. So with the NAACP project, they have incredible um, archival materials that had been in Miss Esther um, M. Lee's basement and she and her daughter Jessica wanted to get those materials into a safe place where they could be preserved. So they asked the institution, can you house them? You do not get to own them. Mm -hmm. So we made sure that contract was, it's a loan. And then when their, their vision of the African American Heritage Center comes to be in Bethlehem, and it will come to be, all of those materials will be there for them to reclaim and take back to that space. And they can reclaim them at any time. Um, uh, so I think that that question, like, what do you need? How can I be of service? And then that can sometimes come back into how courses can be designed. Um, so I'll have students working on public history exhibitions um, that the, the organization wants to have happen. Oh my gosh, here you are. Yes. So you're no, like, I get out of the way. Sarah <laughs> would like to put in a word. Sorry, we're, we're on, we're between you and lunch. I know we are. Um, yeah, so a lot of our, the idea of the Baltimore Field School is that to, to, people applied to that that were community partners and they had ongoing projects and we gave uh, $10,000 to each community partner. And so the biggest issue that we've challenged, I'll use that word, challenge that we found is moving that money, paying people, right? And so I think that's like, the, the work is happening, it's great, it's going really well, but the administrative side of moving that money from a public institution, which I think is, and I think accountability is important, et cetera, but actually getting that money to the people in a, in a way that's accessible, right? That, that people who don't use computers or don't have email, right? Because that's who we're trying to reach in this type of work. So I think that's a big issue that we all deal with in different ways, um, and I think we can do better, and that's what we're trying to do here at UMBC, working with, with Perminda and other folks here. Um, but I do think that's a really important thing that we should be talking about more and figuring out what works in different places and building systems that improve that and push the university to do better because it's, it's not great. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yes, one last easy. word and then we're gonna move to the next lightning round, so yeah. Okay. So, um, just really quickly, in relation to um, not the Chicory Project, but um, a documentary, a student-produced documentary that I worked with uh, with my students on a different project. I found that, so this is, uh, it, was a, it was a documentary on the Mandaman neighborhood. If you know it, you should take a look at all the news coverage of the uh, Freddie Gray uprising, not some riot. Right? Um, I think that in dealing with the community, it's important to establish the fact that there is, like, there's what we get out of it. Hey, I want you to help me with my class and stuff like that, but what do they get out of it? Uh, the documentary that we produced uh, was used by the Greater Mandaman um, Neighborhood Association to kind of promote this idea of like what's going on. And this is a neighborhood that is possibly gentrifying and raising awareness to some of the issues that are going about with like displacement and stuff like that. So as long as it's reciprocal, I think it's a very easy way to work with the community because it doesn't feel like a one-way relationship. They get something also out of the product. <laughs>